Bada bing, bada bing. I'm going to be looking this way. I'm sorry, but usually my fiance's here. Usually he's here. So this is how we're Hello. doing it. <laughs> okay, let's talk about March 2023. So this is a recent case. This is an ongoing developing case. There's this news network called... 2023, so a couple yeah, months ago. A few months ago. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. There's this news network in Utah called Good Things Utah. And it's kind of like a feel-good segment. That's what they do. So they bring on people from Utah and they interview them about their lives. And at the end of the interview, you just feel better about life. You feel like there's hope. There's something to look forward to. So they had this woman on the show. Her name is Corey Richens. And she's like this new breakthrough author in the children's book space. And she's like in a very interesting niche. So her whole thing is that she writes children's books about grief. She's teaching her kids how to grieve the loss of their dad. In the interview, there's like a live audience. There's viewers at home that are watching and listening to how Corey's entire life had changed in the span of like oh my gosh, just a few moments. She went from being a wife to a widow. She went from like being a mom to this huge family of five. So they have three sons together. And now she's a single mom trying to cope and trying to teach her kids how to process these very, very big emotions that, you know, dad is no longer here because he's passed away. So you're talking about three sons and two daughters? No, no, just three sons. You say five kids. Family of five. She said it was really hard to find like a children's book on how to cope with grief. She said, I, I just watched the struggle that my kids were going through, but I just wanted some story to read to my kids at night. And, you know, I just, I couldn't find anything. So I thought, let's write one. She stated, you know, grief is, is about making sure that their spirit is always alive in your home. It's explaining to my kid that just because dad's not here and he's not present with us physically, it doesn't mean that his presence isn't with us. Dad is still here, just in a different way. My husband passed away unexpectedly last year. So it's March 4th was a one year anniversary for us. And um, he was 39. It completely took us all by shock. And we have three little boys. 10, 9, and 6. My kids and I kind of wrote this book on the different emotions and grieving processes that we've experienced last year and, you know, hoping that it can kind of help other kids. The interviewers, they all feel their eyes starting to water because, I mean, just listening to how shocked she felt. I mean, he passed out of nowhere. It was so unexpected. It wasn't a slow death. It's not like he was diagnosed with a terminal illness. It, she was blindsided. And to help her kids through that, it just felt like a lot. And she said that writing this book was a welcome distraction. It was a way for her to put all of these emotions into something that could help other people, into something that was beautiful. And cut. The cameras were off. The interviewers, they shake Corey's hand and they give her words of encouragement like, your sons are so lucky to have you. You're an amazing mom. Don't sit. No, you're doing the best you can. And they know that it's going to get easier. They're saying all these nice things. The host of the show, they see Corey off and they start to head back to their office. They sit down, open up their laptop and they get a new notification, an anonymous email. All it said was, you know, she killed her husband, dot, dot, dot. A fellow news anchor would also receive a private message on her Facebook just a few days later, a few days after the segment went live and the whole message it just read, you need to investigate her. She's a suspect in the husband's murder. The staff at Good Things Utah had just spent the day with an alleged murderer and had absolutely no idea. And soon they would find themselves back on the topic of Corey Richen's new book, but this time they would be updating their audience that she was in jail for murder. This is the case of the viral case of the quote child book killer. So uh, with that being said, we're in New York right now. I know the background's a little bit messy. We're working on it. I'm sorry. But as always, full show notes are available at RottenMinglePodcast.com. A few things to note. At the time of filming this, this case is still ongoing and there are new developments like 
every day, every single week. I mean, truly, this case has a couple of upcoming hearings, and I'm guessing it won't go to trial for quite a few months, but there's been a lot of new things that have been coming out. There are also three young kids involved in today's case, and we're going to be protecting their names, their identities for the purpose of this episode. And since the trial has not concluded yet, the individual in custody has yet to be proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. So any new evidence that comes up could refute some of what we know now, some of the evidence that we have as of now. And uh, lastly, today's case does touch on the topic of use disorders. So if you or anyone else is struggling, links to the resources will be listed in the show notes. So with that being said, let's get into it. March 7th, 2023, a new children's book hits the market. It's titled, Are You With Me? Written by a grieving widow, she had lost her husband and she and her three sons are coping with the grief. They're coping with the loss. And she said that she wrote this book to help other kids and other parents that are in the same situation. And they just, they don't have anything to read their kids and to help them get through the pain. The summary of the book reads, a heartwarming and reassuring book that gently guides children through the difficult experience of losing a loved one. Written by a loving mother who personally faced this challenge, this book is designed to offer comfort and solace to young minds in a way that is both accessible and engaging. Are You With Me follows the story of a child who has lost their father, but who is reminded of his presence still exists all around them. Are You With Me is a must-read for any child who has experienced the pain of loss and for parents who want to provide their children with the emotional support that they need to heal and grow. A story of hope, healing, and the unbreakable bond between parent and child. Wherever you go, whoever you become, their love remains with you. I mean, it's very emotional. It's very... (laughs) It's very loaded, but her social media, the author's social media and Google searches tell a completely different story. At first glance, the author has all the social media dedications you would expect from a grieving widow. She had the Facebook caption that read, Life is just so damn hard without you here. The cards I have been dealt seem like a game that just cannot be played. Hashtag please come home. But when you dig deeper, like if you go on her Pinterest account, you would see that she had a new Pinterest board titled Wedding that was just added 22 weeks before her husband's death. A what? A Pinterest board titled Wedding that she had created 22 weeks before her husband died. So six months. Yes, but just to give you some clarification, they got married years and years ago and they had no new plans to renew their vows. They don't have a daughter or family member that was getting married around that time. And even if she did, it was a bit strange because most of the Pinterest pins inside that wedding board were like wedding lingerie. They all kind of had these sexual undertones. 22 weeks before her husband died, she created this board, allegedly. Now, coincidentally, around that time, she had also allegedly been pinning quotes that would read, Sometimes it's just better to let things be. Let people go. Don't fight for closure. Don't ask for explanations. Don't chase answers. And don't expect people to understand where you're coming from. Like, very heated. She also pinned one that says, You can't change someone who does not see an issue with their actions. You can only change how you react to them. But her Google searches get a lot more blatantly suspicious. The same author that went on to Good Things Utah to talk about how she grieved the loss of her husband and how to remain strong for her kids, she was allegedly found Googling, what is a lethal dose of f***? Death certificate says pending. Will life insurance still pay? What? Can cops force you to take a lie detector test? How to permanently delete information from an iPhone remotely. And maybe the most important one in her perspective, luxury prisons for the rich in America. Shut the front door. I'm serious. Wow. Yeah. So, did we find out what's the luxury prison? I know, okay. I mean, if you want that in your Google searches, be my guest. But I mean, it's kind of crazy that this is after her husband's death. She's allegedly Googling all of these oh, this things. this is after? Yes. The same woman that wrote this Are You There children's book. Mm. So did this woman murder her husband and then write a book for grief for her kids, for other kids? 
She was the evil wife, that's what they call her, to a man named Eric Richens. So Eric is the oldest of the Richens family. And you're like, okay, what does that even mean? So if you live in Summit County, Utah, you might know how important that is. The Richens are one of the largest, most prominent, well-known families in Summit County. Yeah, they're very wealthy. Mm. Very wealthy. But they're not like your stereotypical rich family. It's very interesting. So the Richens were, they were known for generations of hard work and making a name for themselves. They kind of give me Southern vibes, like in the best way possible. Like, they have the generational wealth, but um, this is what people say, and I think they mean it in, like, the best way possible. They're just good, honest country people. They're people that like to be outdoors. They're not really, like, your rich city people, like, trying to shop at Louis Vuitton every day. They're just very, they're into, like, animals and being outside. They even had buildings named after them in the town, but they were not really in it for the money, okay? I mean, to a degree, I'm sure they were, but... They weren't obsessed with like flexing and spending all this money. It helped, but they were just very dedicated people who were very into having a strong work ethic. So their whole family was brought up on family faith and hard work. So Eric is the eldest son, and he grew up on the the Richens family ranch, where he would actually care for the animals and the livestock. So his parents never let him slack. They were like, we don't care that you're the eldest kid. We don't care if you think you're like an heir. You're not going to slack. Not in my life, okay? So they worked him pretty freaking hard. He spent countless hours just helping his dad haul hay, feed the animals, mend the fences. He's like working this ranch. And probably a direct result of this is that Eric ends up a very outdoorsy person. Like he loves anything in the great outdoors, anything to get his hands dirty. It's in nature. I'm talking cross country, sports, hunting, construction. Like he loved all the motor sports, probably not Formula One, maybe Formula One, but like um, he loved like ATVing. <laughs> <laughs> like that kind of motor sports. So like when you think of boys and their toys, like you think of trucks and Nerf guns, but like men and their toys are just bigger versions of that, okay? So he like loved the guns, the boats, the snowmobiles, the ATVs. And this is exactly what Eric loved to do in his free time. He was not afraid to get dirty. He was always on the go. He owned like four wheelers, side by sides, trucks, snowmobiles. I mean, just a whole very expensive collection of toys. And due to his hobbies, he actually broke some records in the family. Yeah, yeah. He had the family record for the most rolls in a vehicle. Most wheels? No, like he would crash and roll. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh. That was like a thing. Okay, they counted. So I guess if you roll twice, that's like two rolls on your sheet. Are you talking about accident? Or? Yes. Oh, just okay. like pure accident. He had the most collisions in a motorized vehicle. Record for that in the family. And after an accident, he had the record of the family member with the most amount of stitches. He had 200 stitches on his face after an accident. What? Yes. And according to his family and friends, there was like never a dull moment around this guy. Whether it be him showing up to a family dinner with no socks and no sleeves on his shirt. And you're like, um, Eric, you're missing sleeves. I know, like it, it looks like you like ripped them off. He's like, oh yeah, I was driving down the countryside. There was no bathroom. So I had to use that. I went outside and you get it. Okay, so sometimes he'd call you and you'd have the most casual conversation like, hey, Eric, what's going on? And he'd just act like nothing's going on. And then at the end, before you hang up, he's like, so by the way, I'm upside down in an ATV right now. I need you to come pick me up and probably let the authorities know. You're like, okay, maybe you should have told me this in the beginning. So he just, he was someone that really liked to surprise people, you know? You just never knew what you were going to get with this guy. So after graduating high school, Eric goes on a two-year mission trip to Mexico City. He learns Spanish fluently. I'm telling you, this guy lived like 25 different lives. And everyone in Mexico City called him Rico while he was there. And they did it in a very, like, endearing way. Everyone there could feel his appreciation for Latin culture, and they just really liked the guy, okay? He was a people person, but not even the way that most people are. Like, meaning, people person means, like, you're good with people. Eric didn't even have to try. I think that's what made people like him. He was just very naturally likable. He was a walking party. Even when it came to serious things like work, working with Eric was always a good time. Eric would come back from his mission trip and he started his own business with a good buddy of his named Cody Wright. So the two start this successful masonry business from the ground up. It was called C&E Stone Masonry. They would essentially install walls. 
but it's not like the walls that you're thinking it's not drywall but i'm talking these crazy concrete walls these stone walls like outside of your home mm. kind of more aesthetic like very fancy <laughs> fireplaces patio walls walkways typically they worked with stone Okay. So, you know, like those like very yeah. intricate. Yeah. I mean, it's considered like a specialty contractor. They were more like artists than anything. And they're really good at what they did. People were constantly coming for them to sign big projects on massive homes, office buildings, everything. From what I could tell, Eric seems like the type of person that I would want to work with. Because, you know, when you're like in this construction business and you're hiring a contractor and you're debating between two firms... There's just always that person that doesn't make you feel dumb and you feel like they actually care about your home and they're like trying to sit you through every single process. They're passionate. They're patient. That's Eric. He put 100% of his effort into every little project that he had, including falling in love. Eric's first marriage was to a woman named Julie. They were married in 2005. They divorced four years later and people said the divorce was really bad. Like, really, really, um, the word that they use is unsavory. It did not end well, and just two years after their divorce, Julie was killed when she was rear-ended from behind by a massive truck going 70 miles per hour. Julie's death is not completely unrelated to this case. Okay, it, it has nothing to do with Eric's death, but I would say that it's related to this case because... Let me just give you the rundown. Her killer was a man that was high on... He literally had smoked it in his car and the smoke had frosted up the window and instead of slowing down when he couldn't see, he sped up and was going 70 miles per hour when he hit Julie and she ended up passing away. Now, like I said, the tragedy is not directly linked to Eric's death, but I would say that it's a huge part of Eric's life. We don't know exactly how he was impacted by his ex-wife's passing, like sudden passing, but I imagine it did something. I imagine it was emotional to a degree. And a big part of how Eric's family responded to that, especially Eric's mom, they just got fiercely protective of Eric. Like, I think it just, you know, when you see someone who's so kind and is such a nice soul and they go through so much heartache, it's almost this primal instinct where you're like, I got to protect this person. I literally have to shield this person so that they don't experience any more hardships in life because they don't deserve it. That's kind of the feeling mm. that Eric's family had. So Eric was heartbroken and, and the family feels really, really bad. Yeah, it seems like it. So by the time that Eric is 32, he's divorced. He wasn't really dating much. He didn't have children, which he wanted. And he was just so focused on his work. That's all he was doing. I think it was just hard to find someone that he clicked with. Especially as you get older, you become stronger in like your beliefs and what you like and who you are as a person. It's harder to be impressed by someone. <laughs> like It's harder to find someone that ticks all the boxes. Home Depot changed everything. Home Depot. This sounds like a Wattpad story. Just follow me because it's real. Eric is at Home Depot. Again, because he's a contractor. He's always at Home Depot. And he goes to the same one every single time. He actually had an older family friend, Linda King, that was working at Home Depot as a cashier. She's like the mom. The mom of Home Depot. That's how everyone saw her. All these contractors would come in every day for work. She would take good care of them. Even if her line to check out was the longest, all of them would wait in line to have their little moment with Mama Linda. And Linda really, really favored Eric. She said, you know, working at Home Depot, you get a lot of these contractor guys, and some of them are really aggressive. Some of them feel like you don't know what you're talking about. Some of them get so upset when you do one thing or they got to wait a little. Never Eric. He was never mad. I mean, even if he had to wait around for an hour for something, never mad. He'd just walk around talking to people. Yeah, just a very nice guy. He was so kind. He would uplift the mood at work, even though he doesn't even work at Home Depot. And one day, Linda spots Eric in her line as usual. But as he's waiting, he keeps kind of like side-eyeing the next cashier over. The new cashier. She's young. She's pretty. And before he could put all of his things down on Linda's belt, she's like, ah, go check out over there. Go. Oh, my God. Go to the pretty young girl's cashier. Okay, go over there. He smiles and he goes over there and he ends up getting all of his things and a date with Corey, his soon-to-be wife and soon-to-be alleged killer. 
Linda thought I was kind of perfect. Like back when they first started dating, they were so adorable. They were so patient with each other. They had like the same sense of humor. Linda said they were glued to each other. I mean, I thought it was perfect. I thought it was a fairy tale romance. I mean, that's what I thought in my pea brain. There was not an inkling that they were bad for each other. Like not even a single little inkling. In fact, this is a story people would go around telling others about. Like how cute is this? Wealthy contractor business owner is at Home Depot. His older family friend encourages him to check out with the young pretty cashier. They get married. I mean, it sounds like a dream, right? And the fact that it was Corey, it made a sense to a lot of people. At least at the time it did. Corey was like the it girl in her little neighborhood. Everyone who knew her said that she was the prettiest girl in town, the prettiest girl in the area. She was also very, very smart. All of her coworkers, including Linda King, would always tell her, don't be a cashier. You got to go do things, you know? You can do it. Go. But that's easier said than done. Corey didn't actually quit until she married Eric, and most likely through his financial stability, she was able to pursue a new career. She became a realtor. Side note, we don't know too much about Corey other than her dad seemed to be in and out of her life. He passed away three years prior to them meeting, and Corey was raised by her mom. The one thing that we know is that Corey was a freaking hustler. Corey was an incredibly hardworking person, and this probably helped her match up with Eric. She was constantly working as like assistants at hospitals. She tried her own hand at a cleaning business. All the while, she's in college getting her healthcare admin degree. She's working at Home Depot she's trying to follow her dreams of being a realtor like this woman worked a lot of jobs and back then linda remembered being so proud of Corey. like just all the accomplishments that she had after leaving home depot she watched them get engaged she watched them get married in 2013 (laughs) she watched them welcome three young sons into the world they were like the ultimate happy ending family fairy tale So Eric grew up in this very religious household and the whole Richens family, they were members of the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints and they continued this into the marriage. It seems like both of the couple, they were quite religious and they were people of faith. We're going to come back to that later. Now, the two settled down in Kamas, Utah. I think I'm saying that right. And the town is very like sleepy suburbia. It's almost as if the town exists in its own little bubble. Like nothing really ever happens in a place like this. But the day that Eric and Corey Richens got married, something did happen. Something that would cast a forever shadow over their whole relationship. On the day of the ceremony, allegedly, Corey was approached by the matriarch of the Richens family, so Eric's mom. She comes by, and allegedly, she had Corey sign a prenup. And you're like, Stephanie, I don't see the problem with this. Neither do I. It just kind of makes sense, you know? The Richens family, they're wealthy. Corey is just starting off in her career. This is Eric's second marriage. And those who saw Eric go through his first marriage, it's I think it's alleged that he didn't have a prenup with his first marriage. And it said that he was drained of his love, hope, spirit, and a whole lot of cash after his first marriage. So, I mean, it kind of makes sense. It doesn't feel all that weird. To Eric's mom, she's just trying to protect her son. She's just trying to make sure that he doesn't go through this same thing over again. You can't really blame her. And Corey did not object. She's like, yeah, absolutely. I'll sign whatever you want. Let's sign it right now. So the document and their wedding certificate were signed June 15, 2013. Under the terms of the prenuptial agreement, if Eric and Corey were to be divorced, Eric's assets and Corey's assets would be split as if they were before they were married. So basically, all of Eric's wealth would go back to Eric. Any houses, rental properties that he had, they would all be Eric's. Any cars, vehicles, all of that. And then Corey's wealth would stay Corey's. It's definitely a bit more complicated than that because there's like community property and all these things. But uh, that's the main gist. What was Eric's was Eric's, and what was Corey's was Corey's. Now, Eric's mom ensured that there would be no mistake in case of a divorce. Like, there would not be another repeat of Eric's first marriage. Under the condition of Eric's death, however, and this is pretty standard in prenuptial agreements, everything that the couple had, including everything that Eric had, would go to the widow or the widower. Again, very normal for a prenuptial agreement because, you know, when you divorce, of course, you don't want your partner to get your things, I guess, because you're divorcing because you don't like them, right? But when you die, you want to make sure that they're taken care of. So 
in the case of Eric's death, all of his assets would pass on to his wife to ensure that she would have enough to support any offspring that they had. Now, most people drafting prenups don't assume that their spouse is going to kill them for it. And clearly, Eric's family, they all had Eric's best interests in mind. There was no way for them to think that that specific clause would become suspicious or twisted or demented later. Again, it's very normal in prenups. However, allegedly, Corey remembered that clause from the beginning. Allegedly. Like literally the day that they signed their marriage, it was probably very clear to her that her husband, Eric Richens, was more valuable to her dead than he was alive. Here's the crazy thing, though, okay? The prenup was just there. It's there for protection. It's not like he was cheap about their marriage or their relationship or even their family. Like, Corey got a lot of financial benefits being married to Eric. She was living in a multi-million dollar house that she wasn't really paying for. She got work connections. She had the ability to buy her kids whatever they wanted. Eric made sure that his family never wanted for anything. Like, he was not shy about pouring his money into the family and, and even pouring his time. Like, not just financially, he would spend a lot of time with his sons. He did his absolute best. In any sport that his son was in, like all three of his sons, because I'm sure they're doing all different sports, they're all in different grades, he was always the assistant coach or the head coach on every single team. And all the other little boys were so jealous. He was the cool dad that everyone wanted. He was always involved. He was so good at sports. They're like, dad, why can't you be that good? Come on, get up off the bleachers. Look at Eric. That's the type of dad. And parents even loved him too. Because Eric was not the type of captain that would go in there and be the coach and be like, okay, I'm going to put a spotlight on my kids. I'm going to make my kids look good. He actually encouraged every single kid to do well. And he was just so excited to take his kids fishing, to help them learn archery. Like, he was just obsessed with being outdoors, and he brought his sons into it. He just really knew how to manage his time, and he had a very successful business on top of all of this. It said that he would even help his wife, Corey, with her business ventures too. So, side note, I hate attributing a woman's success to a man or a husband, but I do think that Eric helped a lot in her career. And let me tell you why. When you're a realtor, especially in a place like Utah, where the, it's Utah, from what I hear, is such a well-connected place. Everyone knows everyone. Everyone's got a friend in every industry, right? To build up your clientele, so incredibly difficult. But very, very quickly, Corey was successful in selling and closing in a lot of luxury homes in Utah. My speculation is I imagine the Richens had a lot of wealthy friends, so it's probably quite natural for them to be like, oh, you're buying a house? Well, Eric's wife is a realtor. Like, here, let me give you her number. She was doing so well, in fact. She started her own real estate company called K. Richens Realty in April of 2019. Wow. Yes. So again, very, very hard for a new up-and-coming realtor to make that much progress. Yeah, yeah. She starts her new venture, and it's flipping homes. It made a lot of sense business-wise. So with Eric's contracting business, his uh, knowledge in the industry, his connections, and Corey's real estate license and her ability to gauge prices in the area and see what's up and coming, it just kind of made sense. So she's doing very well herself at yeah, this point. Yeah, very like, well. She's making money, has her own business. Like, it doesn't seem like she's struggling financially. Yeah. Not at all, yeah. So on paper, they were like the power couple duo of real estate. And it said that they made quite a bit of money flipping homes. And I'm sure that, well, I think, I speculate, this is a personal speculation, that most of the money would be going to Corey because it's under her business. And like the prenup, Corey's wealth is Corey's wealth and Eric's wealth is Eric's wealth. So they would purchase these cheap homes, renovate them, put them up for sale for so much more than what they bought it for, and they would pocket the profits. Then they would repeat. Both seemed to be involved in the business, and a lot of times it would lead to fights. The most recent one prior to Eric's death, literally like days before Eric's death, was about a McMansion from hell. Let me tell you. Okay, this McMansion from hell is a $2 million mega mansion, but the type of ones that look mega produced, overscale, a mini castle, but just like you go on Photoshop and you just widen it and you lengthen it. It just looks like a very... Kind of a weird looking house. Okay. It's a McMansion. It's a pretty tacky home. But not only that, for $2 million, 
It's not even finished. It's just walls and windows. There's no drywall on the inside. Everything is that like um, scratchy wood. There's no flooring. There's no lighting. I mean, it looks like the house is probably made from very cheap materials. Just everything looking at pictures of this house, it screams a money pit and I'm not even in the real estate business. The house is sitting on nine acres of unlandscaped land. There's no pool, there's no landscaping, there's no fence, no gate, and it's not in an established neighborhood. It's If you look at a Google Maps picture of this McMansion from hell, it's smack dab in the middle of nowhere. I would be terrified to live in the middle of nowhere like that. And I'm not talking the middle of nowhere as in like, oh my God, it's like the countryside. No, that's beautiful. I'm talking, it looks like you drive off a highway and there's like businesses nearby and you drive down a road and then it's just your house, no other houses. Just like you and nine acres of unfinished land in an unfinished home. Can you just imagine how much money needs to be poured into a project like that to flip it? And then when you flip it, imagine how small your clientele, your potential buyer pool becomes because how many people buy $10 million homes? How much could you really sell it for? And the amount of time that you would have to pour into this project, it would just... It would be a behemoth to finish. It was honestly a dumb idea. Everyone who knew anything about real estate was like, that's a really dumb idea. There's a reason that no one's buying that unfinished house. And she bought it? She was like, I need to buy it. She just love it. She loves 20,000 square feet of unfinished home in the middle of nowhere. And Eric is like, that is the dumbest business idea I've ever heard in my life. We are not buying that. Like, that's not happening. There was even a guest home that's also unfinished. Like, can you imagine the show that you are getting yourself into? The black hole of money spending? Like, oh my gosh, I don't even know if banks want to be involved in this. It was bad. And you would think that if Corey is going to take advice from anyone, it would be her husband who has a very successful multi-million dollar business that's connected to this industry, that's almost directly related to the real estate industry. Corey was hooked on this house hooked i don't know if she thought this was gonna up her prestige in the business world where she goes from a regular house flipping person to a real estate developer if that's what she's imagining in her head i don't know why she's hooked on this home but she's like a dog barking up a tree cannot get over this house Now, can I just say something? I don't even think that she's that great at her job. So I don't think that she would be capable at flipping this $2 million house. And that's a personal opinion, but um, I will back it up with something. Lawsuits were filed against Corey by a couple who bought a home from her. And they stated that the house was sold to them under the impression that it was fine, but it had significant leaks and toxic mold growing in the home. And it said that these were pre-existing conditions due to improper installations. So these are hazardous levels of fungus in the basement as well as other areas of the residence. And they didn't find out through inspection? No, I guess not. And it's... Then that's the inspection's problem. <laughs> okay. Okay, Mr. But they're saying that Corey knew. Oh, she withheld the information. Yeah. Oh, and wow. then she like covered it up. Oh, that's shady. Yeah. yeah. So that's what they're alleging in the lawsuit. I don't know where it's going to go because, you know, when it comes to stuff like housing, it can get very emotional and I don't know what's going on, but I'll just say... I don't know if she knows exactly what she's doing. So just just bear with me. Eric vehemently denied his wife's request to purchase and flip the McMansion from hell. I feel like he had to be involved. He was involved for some reason. It's not like Corey could just go and close on the house herself. He was involved, and I'm not exactly sure why, and I'm sure it's going to come out during the trial. So the two were fighting so much about it that Eric decided that he would just go ahead and pretend to buy the house. He would put in a super lowball offer on the McMansion from hell just so he could show Corey, like, look, I'm doing something, all right? But he had zero intention of closing on this house. And if you've ever purchased a home, it's typically a long, drawn-out process where you have banks, inspectors, realtors, everybody's involved. Putting in a lowball offer is basically doing nothing because most likely the sellers won't take it. And even if they do, there's contingencies, there's inspection periods. It's a lot. So Eric tells his family that he has no intention whatsoever of actually purchasing this home. He was going to be telling Corey very, very soon. So that means Eric is about to deliver some very bad news to Corey. March 4th, 2022, Eric is found dead. 
and there is a discrepancy in the 911 call. Some say that it is more than a discrepancy. It's a blatant sign of guilt, but I will let you come to your own conclusions. March 4th, 2022, 3 a.m. 911, what's your emergency? The call was coming from the Richens residence, and Corey was explaining to dispatch that her husband was cold on the floor of their bedroom and she was freaking out. She thought that he was dead. She explained how she had gone to sleep in one of the son's rooms because one of the sons was having a nightmare, and she had just snuck in out at like 3 a.m. to go back to the primary bedroom to sleep in her own bed, and she found her husband, the love of her life, cold, dead, on the floor near the base of their bed. She told them that she tried to do CPR, but he was cold. He was cold. Police cars, multiple police cars, ambulances, they all show up to the residence and they're lighting up the entire calm suburban street with chaos of the worst kind. I mean, emergency services, they run in, they're performing life-saving measures on Eric Richens, but it was too late. 39-year-old Eric would be found dead. There was nothing more that they could do. And after a moment of silence for Eric, after the medical team and the police felt that, that like disappointment of having to tell another grieving family member that their loved one is gone, they noticed it, the discrepancy. Corey, the wife, had been telling dispatch and the officers that she had performed CPR prior to their arrival, but there was blood dripping from Eric's mouth and his body was seemingly untouched. Because the blood was so clean, like if you had been performing CPR, uh, it would have smeared a bit. Uh-huh. They did not believe that she had performed CPR on her husband. Now, this alone is not enough to kickstart an investigation into someone, but that someone is the wife. So you have to admit, it's very, it's a bit strange. You would imagine that most people's responses would be to freak out and cradle their loved ones in their arms and like, you're doing everything that you can. You're panicking, you're doing CPR, you're shaking them, you're trying to do everything. Even if you don't know how to perform CPR, you would most likely try to mimic what you see in movies or in documentaries. I mean, of course, there's exceptions to this. Like if there's been a clear homicide, maybe, maybe you wouldn't perform CPR. But in this sense, your husband who is healthy out of the blue collapses and you don't attempt CPR, but you tell people you did. It's a bit strange. Now, another discrepancy is that the police asked Corey what they were doing that night. And this is just like a preliminary like questioning of like, we just want to fill in the blanks. We don't really know what's going on. This isn't a homicide investigation as of right now. We're just trying to figure out. And she said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So earlier today, we were celebrating closing on a new home for the business. They're like, what? Closing on the $2 million house for the business. So at first, the police did not think anything of this because they didn't know that the couple were fighting about this. But she continued, you know, our three sons had gone to bed and we were going to wind down. Eric asked for a drink and for some THC edibles. So I served him a Moscow mule, which is like a vodka based cocktail with lime juice and ginger beer. And she brought him an edible. They're hanging out, having a blast, and then one of the sons wakes up and is like, oh my god, mom, I can't go to sleep, I had a nightmare. So Corey goes to tuck him back into bed, she's reading him a book, and she falls asleep on her son's bed. She states very clearly that she left her phone charging in the primary bedroom. Then she wakes up at 3 a.m., sneaks back into the primary bedroom, and discovers Eric on the floor. So the first discrepancy is she said that she performed CPR. Police do not believe that. Later, the authorities find out that they would not be celebrating the closing of this house because Eric never wanted to close on this house. So that's another discrepancy. And what's crazy is the day after Eric's death, Corey Richens would close on that $2 million McMansion from hell. And with that, the police would slowly but surely unravel the ups and downs of the couple's very dangerous relationship, including the grease incident. Let's talk about the grease incident. So as a sister, I have a sister who's married. I can kind of tell when my sister and her husband are going through some rough patches. And it's typically like my sister will tell me about it or I just kind of get a feeling that they just seem more tense. And most likely it's like an unforeseen life obstacle or like when they first had kids, their their identities are shifting, they're becoming parents, but nothing is too alarming about it. Like you expect that in a marriage. It's not going to be great all the time. But Eric's sisters were shocked at just how bad Eric's marriage was getting. 
he informed his sister that he would be making her the beneficiary of his will and estate. So even if he died, Corey would be getting nothing. Wow. Yes. Not only was he going to make her the beneficiary of his will, but he was going to move all of his assets into a trust, a living trust that she would be the benefactor of or the whatever of. Has he done it yet? Yes, he did it. Oh Three my years gosh. before he passed away. Like secretly? Secretly. Wow. And of course, the sister's going to ask like, oh my God, like, whoa, what's going on? Why would you make me? I mean, uh, you can trust me. I'm not going to say anything and I'm not going to do anything with your money, but something must be going on. Like, you don't just do that. You don't just do that to your wife if nothing happened. He states that Corey had allegedly started stealing from him back in 2016. She was taking money from Eric's accounts and racking up debt in his name without him knowing. Allegedly doing so so she could fund these really bad real estate house flipping ventures that he was not on board with. Corey had allegedly pocketed $100,000 from him, borrowed over $30,000 from his credit cards, and borrowed about $250,000 by using a fraudulent power of attorney. Basically like signing for personal loans because she had power of attorney. Yeah. Okay. She forged his initials on documents that allowed her to act on his behalf without his knowledge. Court documents filed by prosecutors don't disclose the exact date that Eric found out about Corey stealing, but we know for sure that by October 2020, Eric had met with a divorce attorney and an estate planner. It said that Eric confronted her about it and Corey admitted to taking the money. She apologized to her husband and all of that, but but she probably had her fingers crossed behind her back because she just kept doing it. Like she was not going to stop anytime soon. Allegedly, she went as far as taking money that Eric had set aside for federal taxes. Eric's sister would hear about this in bits and pieces throughout the years. And however, something in 2020 would scare Eric so profoundly that he opened up to Katie and told her everything that had been going on behind the scenes. So you know how Eric changed his will so his sister would be the beneficiary instead of Corey? He also changed his life insurance beneficiary. He made his business partner, Cody Wright, instead of Corey, the beneficiary. The reason being is he felt like if he passed, the money from the life insurance would buy Eric out of the business so that CNE would still go on to be successful Mm -hmm. without selling to a third party, without bringing in another partner. So, I mean, this just is another thing that shows how much Eric cared for the people in his life. And this is another thing, like I was saying, the prenup is there, but Eric was not a cheap person. He was not someone that was stingy and nickel and diming because he was rich and you were not. Like, he genuinely cared for the people in his life. Money was not the ultimate end game for him. He cared about his legacy and his business and all these other things. In January 2022, just a few months before Eric's death, Corey had found out that Eric had removed her from the life insurance policy. She allegedly logged into Eric's life insurance account and changed it back. Changed it from Cody back to herself. That's crazy that you can just change it like that. I know. Like, what? That should not be okay. Yeah. Yeah. What? Yeah. So after finding out about this... Eric is feeling very uncomfortable. He draws up a new living trust to give him some peace of mind, and he did this without telling Corey. He changed all the beneficiaries from literally everything from Corey to his sister Katie and his business partner Cody Wright. And it's important to note that Corey would not even be able to think about touching his business if he passed. He made sure of it. He was adamant about it. The Richens' family legacy ran deep. The Richens, the siblings, they were raised to be fiercely loyal. So it was very clear that Eric trusted his sister and Cody way more than he did his own wife. And this distrust would be confirmed in early 2022 when Eric was alerted that Corey had gone into his account and changed it back to her name, right? So this is just, this is bad. He's letting his sister know everything that's been going on. He's like, she knows now. And I don't know what she's going to do now that she knows. So as of right now, just to make it very clear, Corey knew that he had changed his life insurance beneficiary to his business partner. But as of the day of his death, she is under the firm belief that the prenup is still in place and that she will still be the beneficiary of all of his assets. So his assets are one thing. His life insurance beneficiaries are another thing. 
She had no idea that he had transferred all of his assets to a living trust. Eric confided in his sister that he was afraid that his wife would kill him for his money. Now, this concern is undeniably valid. Not only would Corey receive the house, the kids, the cars, all of Eric's snowmobiles, the man toys that he loved a lot, she allegedly would also gain half of his business that's estimated to be millions of dollars, and I think a reported total of at least four different life insurance policy payouts. Payouts reportedly bought between 2015 and 2017, only two years after they were married, and aggregate death benefits were close to $2 million. That's just cash. Which, side note, Eric didn't even know about half of these life insurance policies. Corey had bought them without him knowing just two years after their marriage. Again? Can you do that? I guess so. Like, you can just buy life insurance... For someone I without they knowing? I think you can. Or maybe she forged it. Yeah. Too. And you know, people who kill for life insurance policy, I don't understand because this day and age, that's like the number one thing police are looking for. Yeah. 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 And there's a million ways to find out, right? Even if it's years in advance, like, come on. Or one day when the technology gets there. Yeah. Yeah, I mean. I mean, it's crazy. So, I mean, it just sounds very fishy to me. Like, hey, we just got married. We're both young. We have no health issues. I got a prenup that says I get more money if you're dead than alive. Let me secretly buy some life insurance policies. I don't know. Personally, I think it's weird. Moreover, allegedly in late January of 2022, Corey Richens applied for a new $100,000 life insurance policy on Eric Richens' life. It was issued on February 4th, one month prior to his death. Eric's family told investigators all of this and what happened in Greece. Let me tell you what happened in Greece. A few years ago, the couple went on a vacation to a vacation in Greece. And one night while Eric was on vacation, he calls his sister in a panic. The sister alleged that Eric believed that Corey had just tried to kill him by giving him a drink that caused him to be, quote, violently ill. Eric reportedly told his sister that he thought Corey had tried to poison him. There's even a picture of them coming back from Greece, and netizens have picked this picture apart, stating that Corey's smile, it looks strained. It looks like she's forcing it and she's really thinking, why didn't it work? Why is he still here? Listen, I don't know about the picture, but I will say when you are at a stage where you get sick after drinking something and you think that your partner is trying to kill you, there's something going on. Like, I don't think that's just a crazy thought. There, like, That's your gut. You're like, something weird is going on. It must be so fishy. There must be such suspicious activity going on. So he tells his sisters that. And that's exactly what they think, too. Like, no partner comes to this conclusion unless, unless. So they get back from Greece and it was alarming. But the sisters said they can't really do anything about it because Eric seemed fine. He didn't seem like he wanted to talk further about the incident. And so everyone just kind of assumed maybe he was being dramatic. Maybe that they had gotten into a fight and he had gotten food poisoning while traveling. And it just all kind of merged. Maybe he came down with a stomach bug. I mean, there's genuinely probably a million other plausible explanations to why he felt sick versus your partner is trying to kill you, right? But it stayed in their minds. So this incident was staying in their minds, especially now that Eric was dead. And this uneasy feeling would only grow because autopsy reports were revealed. Eric Richens had died from an overdose of illicit fentanyl. Now, the examiner also concluded that Eric Richens had five times the lethal dose of fentanyl in his system at the time of his death, and all of it was consumed orally. Okay, so a quick thing about fentanyl. It's a synthetic opioid. It can be sold on its own or in pills or in a liquid form for injections. And the side effects are similar to heroin. That's what it's said, but it's not. And let me tell you why it's not similar to heroin. It is 50 times more addictive than heroin and 100 times more addictive than morphine. Think of it as there's two types of fentanyl, pharmaceutical fentanyl and illicit fentanyl. Illicit being illegal or like street. The huge difference between the two is that medical grade propofol and they're manufactured by some of the world's most knowledgeable scientists employed by pharmaceutical companies and are used mostly during a surgery when a patient is under anesthesia. Side note, that is why anesthesiologists make some big bucks in the hospital. They are some of the highest paid doctors because their job is quite literally teetering you on the line of life and death with these types of drugs. They have to go through at least eight years of school and four, if not five years of residency. Like these protections are put into place because these types of drugs, including fentanyl, is so dangerous. So if that's how dangerous medical grade fentanyl is, imagine how dangerous illicit fentanyl. 
fentanyl is. And it is one of the most terrifying things that's happening to our world right now. And it's oddly not that talked about in the younger generations. I, I hear a lot of older people talking about it, but it is tearing families apart. It is ripping loved ones from one another. It is taking countless lives. It's truly scary, not just because it's more addictive than other substances, but right now, a lot of bad people out there are selling drugs with fentanyl cut into it. Meaning, let's say you're buying um, powdered sugar from the guy from the alleyway. You know, it's not powdered sugar, but you get it. You're buying powdered sugar. So right now, what a lot of them are doing is selling you 90% powdered sugar and 10% fentanyl, but you would never know. Why do they do that? Because fentanyl is cheaper than powdered sugar. It's very cheap to produce, and it is so addictive, more addictive than powdered sugar. So you're going to keep coming back to buy that powdered sugar from that guy. And if you guys have been following the news, you know how bad this is. I mean, fentanyl has risen in the ranks of the leading causes of American deaths, and a fent overdose is now the number one leading cause of death for young adults aged 18 to 45 in America. What? It's that bad. It's like a serious, serious epidemic right now. And how this applies to Eric's case is authorities are able to distinguish between the two in one's body, whether it's medical grade fentanyl or illicit fentanyl. And Eric's was illegal fentanyl. So they had to run through all the possibilities. Maybe Eric is abusing other substances that had been cut with fentanyl and he died from an overdose. Maybe he took the the drugs and the fentanyl knowing that he would die. I mean, there's just a lot of possibilities that they have to run through. The police bring in Corey and they ask her, this is like immediately after his death, is Eric on any medications? Again, I think they are trying to get the right answer from Corey, but they're also trying to gauge her reactions and how someone responds to these types of very regular questions. She stated that Eric was indeed on some sort of medications, but she had no idea where they were. She said, and I quote, the maid just puts them in random places. She followed this up by informing the police that Eric had, quote, a pain pill addiction in high school, but... I don't think he's had any substance abuse issues since then. Kind of planting a seed. <laughs> so a few weird things to note, okay, about her response. Corey and Eric had three little children at home. So if there are young kids in the house, why aren't the meds being put in a childproof location in a specific spot? And how are you as a mother just so casually saying, I didn't know where they are. The maid just puts them in random places. You're a mom. Like that sounds insane to me. And second of all, most people are saying, if I had a partner that just died, I'm not telling the police that he had a substance abuse problem in high school, even if it's true. I'm not telling them that. Mm. Why would I tell them that? It's in my best interest not to tell them that because I want to know what happened to my husband. I don't want them to chalk it up to it's probably substance abuse case closed. That's very true. So yeah. it's like she's planting a seed almost. Yeah. Another thing is, most people in Eric's life are like, what are you talking about? He had no problems in high school. Now, I will say that teenagers and people, they can be very secretive. But I mean, every single person, even his sisters that he had been close with his entire life, they said he had no substance abuse problems. Unless you consider like an edible once in a while. Like, this is crazy. So these comments, they just add to the bizarre actions of Corey Richens after her husband's death. So while all of this is slowly, so very slowly being uncovered in the investigation, Corey Richens is oh so very busy. She would play, some say in quotes, some say she's doing it, the part of a grieving wife and mother. She would go on to write and publish and promote her new children's book on grief dedicated to her late husband, Eric. The police could do nothing but continue to investigate while they watched and rewatched her interviews about grief. While they analyzed her facial movements and her body language, they had to watch her play America's Sad Widow while they personally believed that she was guilty of murder. So she also knows she's under investigation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The police were finally able to get a search warrant and this blew the case wide open. One crucial thing to remember is, do you guys remember, Corey stated that she had put her phone in the master bedroom when she had fallen asleep in her son's room. So it was left charging. Yes. Right. So from, let's say, like midnight to 3 a.m., her phone was not in use. It was charging in the primary bedroom. Oh. Forensic techs 
were able to find deleted messages from Corey's phone that had been sent and received around the time period she said that she was not using her phone. On top of that, they have all the evidence that Corey's phone was unlocked and locked a number of times during the hours of the night. You can't even unlock your phone without people knowing, okay? Just keep that in mind. Yeah. So to play devil's advocate, sure, Eric could have been the one opening and closing and playing on his wife's phone, but the deleted messages seem to point in a different direction. Between December 2021 and February 2022, court records show that Corey had been in contact with someone that has been known in the courts as CL. That's how they're identified right now, as an accomplice of Corey's alleged crimes. From the recovered deleted text messages, CL was selling drugs to Corey. She claimed that her client was having back problems. So I guess now your realtor is also your dealer. Okay, crazy. And she said that she needed to buy some like morphine or something. So she would leave money at a house that she was flipping. He would put it into the backyard fire pit. Then she would come and get the drugs and he would take the money. It was like a whole thing. Now it's unconfirmed if CL is the dealer himself or if he's just some sort of middleman. Ultimately, it doesn't matter because in the end, Corey was able to get her little hands on illegal drugs. Wait, so is CL caught or no? Yes. Oh, okay. okay. They're hiding his identity? Yes. Most likely a plea deal and all these things. Yeah. So the first deal was for hydrocodone, which is an opioid painkiller that can very easily be abused. It is a Schedule II drug. It's really, really addictive. It's got a high potential for abuse. It does have medical use, but it's dangerous. So a few weeks later, after she gets her first little baggie of drugs, Corey contacts CL again and asks for something stronger. And she tells CL that she wants, and I quote, the Michael Jackson stuff. The police as well as CL believe that Corey was asking for when she said this which side note in case people aren't familiar with the reference okay michael jackson allegedly died from an overdose of the drug mixture used by anesthesiologists to put someone under so in mj's case he was given um another similar drug that was named propofol which is similar to fentanyl however Corey is asking for the street version which is fentanyl cl gave Corey 15 to 30 pills and Corey paid CL $900 for the transaction. This deal occurred February 11th. Just three days later, on February 14th, 2022, Valentine's Day, Eric and Corey went out to dinner and Eric started getting flashbacks to his trip in Greece. After one bite of a sandwich served him by Corey, he broke out into hives and respiratory distress. He reportedly self-administered his son's EpiPen as well as some Benadryl before passing out for several hours. He told a friend. He told a friend about this. He was like, this happened to me on Valentine's Day, and I think that Corey tried to poison me again. And remember, this is about a month after Eric found out that Corey knew he had removed her from the policies and she switched it back. So his suspicion and fear for his own life was only growing exponentially. And allegedly, on February 26th, Corey asked for another $900 worth of pills from CL. And according to CL, they got the pills for her, left them at the outdoor pit in the same midway flipping home. That would mean Corey picked up the second load of pills worth $900 six days before her husband's unexpected death by fentanyl poisoning. Just one week after the alleged failed Valentine's Day poisoning. So with all this new evidence, the police arrest Corey Richens for charges of aggravated murder, first-degree felony, and three counts of a second-degree felony possession with intent to distribute a controlled substance. I believe the three sons are being taken care of one of the Richens family relatives. They have filed for guardianship. And there's just a lot of loose pieces, so um, I saved them for the end. After Corey found out that she wasn't getting anything after Eric died, she assumed that she was going to get all the assets. She sued Eric's sister for what she thought that should be hers. Corey filed for her insurance payouts and collection of Eric's assets, believing the prenup was still in place. But she found out that Eric himself had removed her and put his sister on there instead three years prior. I mean, okay, so in the world of estate planning, I imagine like there's a lot of, and I'm not sure, so don't quote me on it, but I believe that when someone is, you could argue that someone is in cognitive distress. Mm. Like when someone changes their will like a couple of days before they pass or when they have dementia, you could try to fight it in court. Mm-hmm. But when it's three years prior, it's like pretty, come on, yeah. you know, yeah. what are you going to say? And after she found out about this, Corey sued Katie 
the sister. This legal battle is all occurring like in the year after Eric's death, along with the subsequent police investigation that's going on like at the same time. Corey is suing Eric's sister, Katie, for a, I think, three point six million dollars. She's stating that their family home was $1.4 million. She wants $200,000 of their personal property, about $2 million for the rights to the CNE Stone Masonry, the business, as well as like $3,000 that she had made once for the mortgage payments. Oh, and she said that she helped with the renovations of the home, which costed about $100,000. And she took care of all the landscaping in their family home, which is about $7,000. She maintains that Eric had no right to transfer her share of the property into the trust, and he did so with the intent to hinder, delay, or defraud her. Yeah. Listen, it's just really messy. Eric's sister, Katie, vehemently disputes almost every aspect of her former sister-in-law's claims, and according to court documents, Corey's name was not on the home's deed, And in June of 2022, Katie countersued Corey and stated that Corey did not purchase or in any way contribute to the purchase of the family home. Evidence of this was the fact that she was just a cashier at Home Depot and like, sure, she could have saved up money, but like, it's a very expensive home and there's no proof that she had contributed that much money, if that makes sense. Katie also states that she's not trying to get money from Corey by filing this countersuit. She simply wants the claim dismissed and wants the attorney fees and court costs paid off. That's it. What's even crazier, it's also been alleged that the morning after Eric had died, the day that Corey had closed on the McMansion from hell, she held a gathering to celebrate Corey's new business venture. The day after the death? Yeah. Wow. So there are allegations that Corey physically assaulted Eric's sister once she found out that she wasn't getting any assets. But the only source I could find on that claim was the Daily Mail. So I don't know. We just have to wait and see where the lawsuit goes, as well as the trial. The case went very viral because, well, you have the children's book, the interview that Corey had on Good Things Utah, and a lot of netizens have picked that interview apart. They noticed that Corey was strangely wearing this big brown leather jacket with a hood. There's a reason you never see people on TV wearing hoods, unless it's for a show. Like for an interview, you never see people wearing hoods. What's a hoodie? Like a hoodie. So she's wearing a hoodie and then a brown leather jacket. Mm -hmm. You don't see that outfit a lot on cameras because it's very heavy for these interviews. It's like up to your neck. It kind of makes your proportions not look great. She's also sitting with her legs crossed and her hands holding her legs. And a body language expert named Patty Woods said, again, this is not very standard clothing for an interview. And typically like, these producers will tell you like kind of the general vibe of what to wear, right? And uh, she wore this. She wore these heavy things. She wore these colors. She wore the hood because what it does is it protects someone. So like you ever feel anxious or you ever feel like you're doing something that maybe you feel like you shouldn't be doing, you probably feel more subconsciously comfortable in a hoodie where more of your body is covered. Like your neck is a little bit shielded. You feel like not all of you is exposed. Netizens were also very quick to feel like she wasn't that emotional during her interview and she wasn't wearing her wedding ring, which again, it could be very normal things, but it just kind of rubbed netizens the wrong way in hindsight after she was arrested. Now, the body language expert, again, in hindsight, said that um, she just doesn't seem very passionate about her message. Even when she's talking about her kids, she doesn't smile genuine smiles. She doesn't move forward towards the host, which is like a sign of I'm opening up to you, I'm being vulnerable with you, and I'm very attentive. It just felt very detached. Again, as for body language, I'm not a huge fan of picking it apart and everything can make sense in hindsight, but I just wanted to include it because I know a lot of you guys would want to know. Now, a lot of people also believe that Corey's book title and theme are also revealing. One netizen wrote, I feel like she wrote the book to minimize what she did. It's almost like, see, he's still here. It's not that big of a deal that he died. It's fine because he's still here. So I guess they're saying like psychologically the content of that book is also kind of strange. I don't know. I'm also just curious about why she wrote a book. Okay, so there are some speculations. The main speculation people think is that she wanted to profit. She Mm. did the murder for money. Allegedly, she murdered for money. And now she's thinking, okay, this is my way to fame and money. And technically, it's a very marketable 
background story for a children's book author. Wow. And then some people say that it's probably a mixture of that and she's a narcissist. That's like just pure greed, right? Just That's pure like evil. Evil greed. One like, more thing. Yes. You were saying that she was looking at weddings? Yeah. Okay. So it is um, alleged that she was probably having an affair. And this was the perfect way for her to be a rich bachelorette who could go on and move on with a new man or be single again. Yeah. Hmm, okay. Because uh, a lot of people in their lives also allege that she was having an affair. There was recently a trial hearing a few days ago. And side note, Corey pled not guilty. But Amy Richens, Eric's sister, shared a victim impact statement. And she said, Eric is gone and I'm brokenhearted. He was my best friend and protector. I can never talk to him, never hug him, never even be a part of his life. She also alleged that... Um, Corey would tell the kids that Eric, their dad, didn't like them and that the Richens family were evil and didn't like them. And she would constantly try to use the kids to her advantage. She would constantly manipulate them into being away from their own father and the father's side of the family. And she said, I never knew evil like that existed. How can someone value human life so cheaply? I cannot comprehend it. I just feel bad for the family because it doesn't seem like Corey is going to go down easy. So far, her attorneys have alleged that Eric had been cheating on her as well and that he wanted her to be a stay-at-home wife and homemaker. And because she was so successful at her real estate business, he was feeling threatened. Yeah, she's also making a big deal on stating that she believes the Richens family hired a PI to stalk her before the arrest. So, I don't know. I think it's just going to be very messy. And it's just ultimately like the kids are the biggest victims in this. But that is where we are now. And as for Eric Richens, not only was Eric an amazing member of his own family and a natural born entrepreneur and a protector, but um, he was very faithful to the LDS faith. And from my understanding, it said that when a member of the LDS faith dies, they will join their God and their family later in eternal heaven, where they're joined by their kids, their parents, their siblings. And so I hope that I hope that he's there. And that one day after his children have these long, healthy, happy, full lives, they will be together again. So that's it for today's case. Please stay tuned for any updates. And I'm interested to see what you guys think about the case so far. But I'll see you guys in the next episode on Wednesday. Please, please be safe. Bye.